And if you have a copy of God's Word, I'd ask you to go ahead and turn to 2 Timothy chapter 2. 2 Timothy 2. And my clicker, there we go. Uh, But God, His foundation. So we're going to start off, I know that the kids are kind of getting geared up and kind of back to school. So I want to kind of give, I mean, I know that the kids love a good story problem, right? Okay, kids love this. Okay, so here's the story problem. So Pastor Mark is going to preach a sermon series, and there's going to be 12 sermons in this sermon series. It's but God, okay? He's preached six of them. How many are left? Six. Okay, good job. I'm glad to see that the kids are on fire already this morning. They are ready to go. Even a few of the parents are struggling with this, but that's okay. Okay, so uh, we are in our series, But God. So there's uh, these a number of statements through Scripture where we're going down a path, and, and we see this but God that interrupts something and dramatically changes the direction. And so we're just picking out 12 of these, and we're going through that as our summer series. And so we're in the middle of this series. Uh, today is uh, our, uh, we have six left, including today. So today we're in 2 Timothy 2, 19. That's going to be our uh, core text. Um, we will start in verse 14. Uh, while you guys are turning there, I um, want to share a quick story to kind of get us, get our minds around this. So there was a salesperson that was driving through, and, and he's kind of in this more rural area, uh, and he's a long ways from home. But he's, he's driving down the road, and he notices uh, this barn. And on the side of this barn, he sees all these arrows in the side of the barn, but they are perfectly, they perfectly hit these bullseyes that are on the side of this barn. And so he's driving by, he's driving down the road, but he's just thinking about that. He's like, boy, this just is really an odd, just an odd thing that I saw. And I, I've never seen something like this before. So he ends up stopping his car, he turns around, he goes back to the house. And he knocks on the farmer's door and he says, you know, I drove by, I just can't, I just, I can't uh, not stop and just ask, who is this amazing archer? I mean, who is it that is just so good? I mean, there's, some of them are way high up, some of them are down, they're all over the place, but they've perfectly hit the bullseye. So the farmer says, well, he says, uh, let me tell you the story. He says, uh, I've got kind of, a, kind of a crazy neighbor. And what my neighbor does is he'll just shoot arrows into my barn and then he grabs a bucket of paint and he walks up there and he draws a bullseye perfectly around so that, my, so that his arrow is in the center of it. All right, well, so obviously he's kind of taking a different approach about having, hitting the mark or hitting the target. We're going to take a look at God's Word, and we're going to see how exactly we, on target we are when we think about God's Word. Okay, so hopefully by now you're in 2 Timothy chapter 2. We're going to start in verse 14. So uh, please read along with me. It starts by saying this, Remind them of these things and charge them before God not to quarrel about words which does no good, but only ruins the hearers. Do your best to present yourself to God as one approved, a worker who has no need to be ashamed, rightly handling the word of truth. But avoid irreverent babble, for it will lead people into more and more ungodliness, and their talk will spread like gangrene. Among them are Hymenaeus and Philetus, who have swerved from the truth, saying that the resurrection has already happened. They are upsetting the faith of some. But God's firm foundation stands, bearing this seal. The Lord knows those who are His, and let everyone who names the name of the Lord depart from iniquity." Well, here inside this section, we are uh, introduced to Hymenaeus and Philetus. And actually, Hymenaeus is actually mentioned one other spot, and it's in the first letter to Timothy. So this, just by way of background, here's Paul. Paul, this is uh, probably the last letter that Paul wrote before he was uh, executed. And Paul is waiting his execution. Paul has written, there's these kind of what we would call the three pastoral epistles. And so that's First and Second Timothy and Titus. And in these three letters, the primary focus is Paul kind of sharing his wisdom, trying to equip Timothy and Titus, who are then going to go on and be leaders within the church. And they're going to continue to plant churches and build up these churches. 
So here's Paul, and he's, he's kind of imparting all of this wisdom. Well, Hymenaeus must be a pretty tough character because he showed up already in 1 Timothy, and he's repeated again in 2 Timothy. Not a lot of people are named in Scripture. If you're named in Scripture and you're named twice for being a false teacher, that's not good. So we're, we're introduced here to uh, a pretty uh, tough character, Hymenaeus, and Philetus. So he names them by name. So these are uh, folks that, are, uh, that have swerved from the truth. So he's kind of showing them in this contrast. Now, Hymenaeus in, in, the, in 1 Timothy, when we talk about Hymenaeus, uh, we are introduced to him, and, they, and Paul describes Hymenaeus as one who has made a shipwreck of his faith. He's made a shipwreck of his faith. And so we're going to look at the signs of a shipwrecked faith, signs of a shipwrecked faith to begin with. So the first part of it is forgetting God's teaching, forgetting God's word. And we see it in the very first word in the section that we just read, remind, remind them. So of course, to remind them means that we minded them to, the, to begin with, right? So if we're going to remind them, so we have to tell them again. So he's, in, he's giving Timothy instructions as to t- explain it again, pour it over them again. So remind them of these things. Well, up until this point in uh, 2 Timothy, Paul's instructions really have been specific to Timothy. So Paul's been talking very specific to Timothy to do certain things. In fact, you're already in verse 14. If you look at verse 8, you'll notice that in verse 8 in the section, he says, remember, the first word, remember Jesus Christ. So in that section, he's talking to Timothy, telling him, remember this. Now he switches gears and he's telling Timothy to remind the congregation. Remind those, remind the church, those that you're leading, remind them. So it's important for us to remember. Signs of a shipwrecked faith are that they would forget God's word, that they would forget the teaching of God. The second one is this, quarreling about words. Look in verse 14 again. You see, quarreling about words. Now, again, this is a theme that has been picked up that that, uh, Paul has already mentioned a couple of times. I'll give you a couple examples of those. Here's earlier in 1 Timothy 1, verse 3. uh, It starts, As I urged you when I was going to Macedonia, remain at Ephesus, so that, I have this up on on the screen, so that you may charge certain persons not to teach any different doctrine, nor to devote themselves to myths, and endless genealogies, which promote speculations rather than the stewardship from God that is by faith. So that comes from 1 Timothy chapter 1. Later in 1 Timothy chapter 6, he picks up on this theme again. If anyone teaches a different doctrine and does not agree with the sound words of our Lord Jesus Christ and the teaching that accords with godliness, he is puffed up with conceit and understands nothing. He has an unhealthy craving for controversy and for quarreling about words. There's that same phrase, quarreling about words, which produce envy, dissension, slander, evil, suspicions. And then also in Titus, the same theme is picked up. It says this, uh, but avoid foolish controversies, genealogies, dissensions, and quarrels about the law, for they are unprofitable and worthless. So this whole idea about quarreling about words is something that was important to Paul and he picks up on in a few different spots. But our third sign for a shipwrecked faith comes with the irreverent babble. Look at that in verse 16. We see the irreverent babble. Timothy, uh, in 1 Timothy, uh, he uses the phrase vain discussions. You know, I've seen this in a couple of different places. I've actually seen it in a number of different ways. A couple examples that I'll give you. Um, I was in a small group a number of years ago, and there was a man that was uh, in there, and he had a grown son that was out on his own. Uh, and and uh, this man just, just, his heart wrenched for his son. 
Uh, he was a strong, uh, this, this, my friend that was in the, our small group, a uh, strong believer in Christ, had always tried to raise his kids up as best he could in the church. Uh, and his son was just caught up in this irreverent babble, these myths. And so they got, uh, his, his son was just uh, preoccupied in this unhealthy way with the story of Enoch. I talked about Enoch last week, of Enoch being a unique individual in Scripture that actually didn't go through the death process, was just caught up by, by, by God. Well, that's a unique story in the, in the uh, Old Testament. Um, there's really not a lot that we build around that from a faith, but, but certain people will get caught up with it. And they'll make a religion around it, or they'll make this uh, unhealthy focus about some uh, obscure part of Scripture. And they'll make it more, they'll replace the, the true gospel with this mysticism. Another example that we have seen in recent uh, years has been uh, movies like, for example, The Da Vinci Code, that book and the movie that came along with it. Uh, they kind of pick up on this irreverent babble and quarreling about words. And then finally, our fourth point here, signs of a shipwreck faith swerving from the truth. You see that in verse 18, uh, those that have swerved from the truth. Now, in this case, what they swerved from was they didn't, they didn't view the actual bodily resurrection of Christ and us. They didn't, under, they didn't rightly understand it and weren't rightly teaching it as well. I'll actually pick up on this uh, later in our discussion this morning. So again, these are signs of a shipwrecked faith. If you see this, if you're talking to somebody and you see some of these things, there's, there's a sign there that they've got a shipwrecked faith. Well, we want to look at the damage of a shipwrecked faith in our text, and we find it. Uh, we find it, first of all, in, uh, in verse 14, it ruins the hearers. It ruins the hearers. It does no good, but it only ruins the hearers. The original language uses this word catastrophe, and that's where we get our word catastrophe from. So catastrophe has showed up in the original language, and it just means this overthrowing, this uh, subversion, this overturning, this demolition. We can see what this looks like in Scripture. So this, uh, this, uh, that's what it does. It ruins the hearers. It ruins the faith of the hearers. The second point that he brings up is, is that it leads people into ungodliness. Uh, in verse 16, you see that it spreads untruths and leads people into ungodliness. Then in 17, do you see this? And their talk will spread like gangrene. Now, I am not one, as soon as we talk a little bit about blood and guts and things like that, I might get a little lightheaded, so I'm not going to get in too much detail there. But just suffice it to say, if you cut off circulation to a part of your body, if I were to hold my finger really tight, then the blood, then the blood circulation gets cut off and it'll turn black and it turns and it has gangrene. So that means that part of the body has died. And what happens is, is that if, it, if it's left untreated, it will spread. So that dead part of your body will actually start spreading through the rest of your body that's living. Because it, has been, uh, because it has no more oxygen, there's no more oxygen and blood left in that. And so surgeons actually have to do amputations because of that. So gangrene is caused by cutting off the blood and, and the flow of, of, blood, of, of blood to the body part. Now here's what's an interesting connection to this. Look at the remember scripture that we just talked about. So if you think about it, remind them. So one of the exhortations that Paul gives to Timothy is to preach the word, to, to remind the congregation of the word of God. We have to remind, we have to keep filling ourselves full of the word of God. You can kind of think about this as our blood flow. This is the flow of blood to us. If we, don't, if we are cut off from it, then we die. Then we, we lose everything. And so that's what's important to remember. So it's, I think it's really interesting to see that this gangrene uh, topic is brought up, this gangrene idea. And you can see there's just this cut off of the blood supply, of the, of the flow of blood. We get that same idea from the reminding people of the Word of God. And finally, the third point in the damage from a shipwrecked faith is, is that it upsets the faith of 
of some. And this upset, uh, we get this idea of overthrowing or subverting. We see this in verse 18. They are upsetting the faith of some. So this is the damage from a shipwrecked faith. Now there is a, a Christian uh, worship band named Hawk Nelson. And the lead singer of Hawk Nelson is a man by the name of John Steingard. Now, John Steingard has recently announced uh, that he has departed from the faith, that he has left the faith. Now, this surprised a lot of people. John grew up in a Christian home. He was the son of a pastor. In fact, his wife, her father is also a pastor. So his father-in-law is a pastor as well. He was a lead singer of a popular Christian band. But again, recently he had announced that he had departed not only from the Christian faith, but also just to say that he does not believe in a God at all. Well, he was interviewed. He was interviewed. There was a Christian uh, a gentleman on YouTube that interviewed uh, John and was asking him a few questions. And he brought up this point. The interviewer asked John, he says, John, you described uh, your Christian belief as a sweater that slowly was pulling strands away until there was no more sweater left. Then the interviewer asked him this question. He said, well, he he stated this point. He says, stating that the world is inherently evil, that there's sin in the world, that there's sin in myself, and Jesus is the parachute that saves me from this world that's going down in sin. Then he asked him this question. When did you start to see your belief in God as an accessory like a sweater rather than a necessity like a parachute? And it was at that point that John just stopped. He was quiet for a minute, kind of looks around a little bit, and he says this, Well, if I'm being totally honest, I may have thought about it more like a sweater and less like a parachute my whole life. He would go on to say, I may have spent my whole life with the perspective of God that was not what you or other strong believers have. You could see he was a true casualty of a shipwrecked faith. He was not built off of a firm foundation. The Apostle Paul was regularly teaching and warning about false teachers. In fact, in in Acts chapter 20, Acts chapter 20 is when Paul uh, bears, uh, wishes farewell to the elders at Ephesus. So Paul, in, in Acts chapter 20, he gathers the elders around them, and he knows that he's leaving. And he knows that this is going to be the last time that he sees these elders in Ephesus. And so he pulls the elders together, and he's imparting his last thoughts to them. So Acts chapter 20, uh, he, he imparts all kinds of wisdom to that. And as he's sharing all of these last parting thoughts, he says this. He says, starting in verse 29, I know that after my fierce wolves will come in among you, not sparing the flock. And from among your own selves will arise men speaking twisted things to draw away the disciples after them. I'm sure when Paul, the apostle, said this, the elders were standing around thinking, my goodness, who is he talking about? I know these people. These These are the early church leaders, and he's saying right there that from among your own selves will arise twisted, speaking twisted things and draw the disciples away. I'm sure that this would have been dramatic speak. I'm sure that everybody would have walked away going, oh my goodness, who is this? Who is it? Who amongst us will draw people away? We don't know this for a fact, but it's possible that Hymenaeus and Philetus could have been part of this group. They could have been part of the elders listening to this speech from Paul back in Acts chapter 20. That's a possibility. Paul was concerned about false teaching during his time And we should be concerned about it today. And it's in this backdrop. It's in the the backdrop of all of this. The false teaching, the uncertainty, the people swerving from the truth, the damage of of a shipwrecked faith. That's 
in the middle of all of this, that's when we get our statement. That's when we come through and see 2 Timothy 2.19. But God's firm foundation stands. Bearing this seal, the Lord knows those who are His. And let everyone who names the name of the Lord depart from iniquity. There is something that we can rely on. In the face of all of the uncertainty that's out there, we can rely on God's firm foundation. His firm foundation stands. In this text, he's basically put this contrast out there between Timothy, the firm foundation, and Hymenaeus, who is going to be washed away. So now let's look at signs of God's foundation. We start with remembering God's Word. We talked about it in verse 8 in the instruction that that, uh, Paul has given to Timothy. He says, remember Jesus Christ, in verse 8, remember Jesus Christ, risen from the dead, the offspring of David, as preached in my gospel, for which I am suffering, bound with chains, uh, as a criminal. I mean, he just, he points Timothy right back to the gospel message, the core foundation. That's the foundation. That is God's foundation. The second sign is to not be ashamed. In fact, there's really interesting wording in verse 8. 15, present yourself to God as one approved, a worker, an approved worker, not ashamed. You know, I had shop class when I was in junior high, and I remember that in shop class, we made these uh, little picture frames. Well, actually, the picture frames were kind of made for us, but they weren't sanded off nicely, and we put these little things in the picture frame, and actually, to this day, my mom has those hanging up. Now, they're hanging up in a remote corner of the bathroom, but they're still hanging up there. I can still, I still know where they're at. So anyway, um, but, but as we were sanding these, when I was in junior high, we would sand them and our shop teacher, Mr. Adams, he would give us, we would start off with very coarse sandpaper and we had to sand out all of the, all of the little marks uh, on these things. So I had to work through, you start with the coarsest grit and then, um, then as you got that part done, then he would give you the, the finer and the finer and the finer grit. But you had to bring it to him. You had to hand in your, uh, your picture frame to Mr. Adams. And he would look, and he had these glasses, and he would look in there, and he would see whether or not it was approved or not to go on to the next uh, finer grit of sandpaper. I could never see what he was looking at. I just sanded a whole bunch, and then I would turn it in. And he would say, no, you got to sand it some more. I would sand it some more, and I would turn it in. So I never really could understand it. But he was the approved, he was the one that was the approver. So he was the one that would determine if I've sanded enough and I'm ready for the next grit of sandpaper. Well, we kind of get that same picture in this, uh, in this section about being an approved worker, a worker that is approved by God. God is the one that is approving us. He is our approved, he, he will make us approved workers. And in this section, we see that we are not ashamed. We are approved workers because we are not ashamed. Uh, the third point that we bring up is this rightly handling of the word. Rightly handling. We also see that in verse 15. This rightly handling, when we look at the original language around this rightly handling, handling it means to cut straight like to cut a straight path. Maybe another way that they're using it would be if you imagine that you're going to lay out a new road and you're going to put a new road in. Well, you'd cut, this would lay a straight path. You'd cut through the woods uh, in in a straight way so that it'd be a straight path through the woods. So that is the, uh, like cutting in a straight line or dividing rightly. And, we, and it's interesting because in verse 15, we talk about cutting straight, but then notice in verse 17, he talks about swerving from the truth. So we see this idea of cutting straight to the Word of God or those that have departed the faith that are swerving from the truth. So approved workmen will rightly handle or cut straight the path of the Word of truth. Well, what is the Word of truth? Well, again, we, we're right in there. So if you look at 2 Timothy, you're already in 2 Timothy 2. Just look to 2 Timothy 3, starting in verse 14. 2 Timothy 3, 14, he tells us what the word of truth is right here. He says this, But as for you, continue in what you have learned and have firmly believed, knowing from who you learned it. Verse 15 says this, And how from childhood you have been acquainted with the sacred writings. 
which are able to make you wise for salvation through faith in Christ Jesus. Verse 16, a famous uh, verse that many of you are familiar with. All Scripture is breathed out by God and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, and for training in righteousness. Verse 17 goes on to say that the man of God may be complete, equipped for every good work. Let me read that again. Verse 17, the man of God may be complete, equipped for every good work. The approved worker is going to be a man of God, will be someone that has learned from God, that is, that is tight with the Scriptures. You are a man of God. You are a person from God when you have, when you have rightly handled the word of truth. So that's our third sign of God's foundation. And here's our fourth, that they depart from iniquity. Do you see that in verse 19? Let everyone who names the name of the Lord depart from iniquity. We should be running from sin. Now in this section we see uh, an important part, and that is that the Lord knows those who are His. Do you see that in verse 19? But God's firm foundation stand bearing this seal that the Lord knows those who are His. The Lord knows those who are His. The Lord knows you. We often say in evangelical circles, do you know Christ? Do you know Jesus? Do you know Jesus as your Lord and Savior? We're going to look at this from the other direction though. Does God know you? Does God know you? You know, in in the Old Testament, uh, uh, there was a woman by the name of Hagar and she was a servant of Sarah. And Hagar and, and Sarah treated Hagar harshly. And after that, uh, after that event, Hagar went out into the wilderness. She basically ran away. And the Lord met Hagar out in the wilderness. And the Lord gave instructions to Hagar and said, I want you to go back. I know it's tough. I know that Sarah was, was, was wrong. She dealt harshly with you, but I want you to go back. I've got a purpose for you, and I want you to go back. And after that exchange between the Lord and Hagar, then we get this in Genesis 16. She gave this name to the Lord who spoke to her, You are the God who sees me. You saw me, God. You saw me. For she said, I have now seen the one who sees me. I have now seen that person. So God saw me. I have now seen God who saw me. Now this idea of connecting false teachers, a firm foundation in knowing God, has happened in a number of sections in Scripture. Now, I'm going to ask you to turn with me uh, to a section that you've read a number of times. You've read this a number of times, but you might not have seen the connectivity between all of these parts. So we've just talked about the false teachers, that the Lord knows me, and God's foundation. That's been the key part of our text today. I'm going to have you turn to another section in Scripture, and that is Matthew chapter 7. Turn with me to Matthew chapter 7. Again, this is going to be a familiar part of Scripture that most of you have read a number of times, but you might not have seen this connection and how it flows between these three parts. So first of all, in verse 15, it says this, Beware of false prophets who come in to you in sheep's clothing, but but inwardly are ravenous wolves. You will recognize them by their fruits Are grapes gathered from thorn bushes or figs from thistles? So every healthy tree bears good fruit. But the diseased tree bears bad fruit. A healthy tree cannot bear bad fruit, nor can a diseased tree bear good fruit. Every tree that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. Thus you will recognize them by their fruits. Beware of the false prophets who wear sheep's clothing. They're wolves. They're inwardly, they're ravenous wolves, but they're in sheep's clothing. So Jesus is giving these instructions. But now, look at the very next section. Right after this, we get right into it. 
verse 21, not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but the one who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. On that day, many will come to me saying, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name and cast out demons in your name and do many mighty works in your name? And here it is, verse 23. And then I will declare to them, I never knew you. I never knew you. Depart from me, you workers of lawlessness. And then, what, then what's next? Look at verse 24. Everyone then who hears these words of mine and does them will be like a wise man who built his house on the rock. And the rain fell and the floods came and the winds blew and beat on that house, but it did not fall because it had been founded on the rock. And everyone who hears these words of mine and does not do them will be like a foolish man who built his house on the sand. And the rain fell and the floods came and the winds blew and beat against the house and it fell. And great was the fall of it. Jesus has warned us about the false teachers and the impact of them. The shipwrecked faith, the shipwrecked faith and what that can do, the, how it wreaks havoc on us. But he also contrasts that to God's firm foundation. You know, as I was reading through this text, I uh, couldn't help but think of a, an event that happened very recently. So I just put up a gazebo on my deck. I just put up a gazebo on my deck less than a week before our inland hurricane. So on this gazebo, there are six posts. Again, I know the kids did a great job with the first math problem. Let's see if they can do this one. And this one's even harder. Okay, so there were six posts on my gazebo, and each post had three holes that I could secure it down to the, to the deck. So how many total uh, holes were there? 18. Thank you, kids. Okay, <laughs> so there were 18 holes for me to build this foundation of the gazebo. So as I put this gazebo up, and each individual piece that I put up seemed pretty lightweight. I mean, I could easily hold this big piece in my hand. It was pretty lightweight. So I put all of these pieces together, bolted them all together, and screwed them all together. And, and after it was all together, I was like, okay, well, it's a little bit more firm than what it felt like when I looked at the individual pieces. So I hope, but boy, this thing feels like it's still a little light. And I know how we get some pretty heavy winds and tornadoes and things like that. So I'm going to do everything that I can to bolt this thing down as securely as I possibly can. So the next day after I put it all up, I got 18 bolts. And they said you can put wood screws into it. But I'm like, no, I'm going to secure this thing with the thickest diameter bolt that I can fit through these little holes. So I can fit a 5 16 bolt through those. So I got 18 of them. And so underneath the deck, I put a plate and I, and I bolted these things through. So, so there's bolts all the way through. I just, I, I was so nervous about this thing blowing off my deck and smashing into my house. Okay, so that was my thought before all of a sudden the sirens start going off. And now we have this inland hurricane. So I'm literally, during this time, I'm literally standing five feet away from my gazebo. I'm standing in my kitchen just watching this thing. And for 45 minutes, I'm watching the wind just pound this gazebo. And this whole time, I mean, I'm sweating bullets. And I've just resigned myself to the fact that this thing is just blowing. I know that this thing is going to go. Because, I mean, I've touched this thing. I know how flimsy this thing feels. And I know how strong this wind is whipping. I mean, this wind is blowing so hard that, that there's doors in my house that are whistling. So this wind is crushing through there. I'm watching this gazebo and it's holding on. I'm like, oh man, it's just a, just a matter of time. And then all of a sudden, one of those big gusts comes through and it, it shakes just a little bit, but it holds. And you know, while I was thinking about it, while I was watching this, I realized there's nothing I can do at this point. Whatever I have done to try to secure this thing to the deck is done. I can't go out there right now and do anything more. So right now, this wind is just pounding on my gazebo. And for 45 minutes, it does that. And in the end, it holds up. In the end, my gazebo holds up. 
It's because I went crazy on the foundation. I, I did everything that I, did, I could do. I secured it in the most extreme way that I could to my deck. And you know what, folks? We have to build up that foundation. The storm is going to blow. You will be tested spiritually in your lives. The time to, do the, to, ta- the time to build the foundation is before the storm, not during it. It was right after I got to putting it up. It was a beautiful day out at the time. It was, I think, in the low 70s. At very ca- there was no wind out there. It was sunshine. It was beautiful. And my son and I were out there putting these, b- building this thing down as, as, as securely as I possibly could because I knew that maybe someday there would be a heavy wind that would blow through there. And I, took, I did everything that I could. During the storm was completely worthless. At that point, it's too late. You've got to build on God's firm foundation before the storm hits. That's my plead to you. Here's the other aspect of that. Has the storm already hit you? You've, if you've been a Christian long enough and if, you, if you've lived in this world long enough, there's probably been some spiritual storm in your life already. And you know what we just did? We went out there and we tightened up a few of the bolts. There was a few of them that were a little loose. A few of them that were a little loose and so we tightened them up so that we're ready for the next spiritual storm. And that's my plead to you. My plead to you is tighten up, build your foundation on God's Word. God's firm foundation will always stand. It will take this flimsy gazebo the flimsy spiritual people that we are. And boy, can I fold like a lawn chair in some cases. I've got proof of it in my history. But you know what? I'm bolted to the firm foundation of God. That is what will carry me. My foundation in God and God alone. Me, I'll fold like a lawn chair, but God, His firm foundation will stand. And that's when we remember our core text, our take-home verse comes from 2 Timothy 2.19. But God's firm foundation stands, bearing this seal. The Lord knows those who are His. And let everyone who names the name of the Lord depart from iniquity. Let's pray. Heavenly Father and gracious God, thank You. Father, thank You that in the face of the storms, we have the firm foundation of You. Father, your firm foundation makes us look so much stronger than what we really are. Father, I pray that we are firmly planted there. Anyone who's wavering, anyone who's got questions, I pray that they are focusing on the firm foundation of you and you alone. Father, we see a number of people falling around us. I gave one example earlier, but there's many around us. There's many high profile and many of our friends that have departed from the faith. And again, we know that they are not tied to a firm foundation. I pray that you would do just that. Build us up. Grow us in our foundation. Grow us from a foundation of you and you alone. Father, thank you for that gift and we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. It's now at this point in time that we will enjoy communion. Uh, we celebrate communion. Anyone who has uh, proclaimed Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior is welcome to join us. They have some elements over on the table. If you haven't had a chance to get one, uh, feel free to go grab one right now. Otherwise, you're welcome to open that up.